Hello, welcome to the studio for my first ever Vlogmas video. In this video, I'm going to turn this blank pad of 5 by 7 watercolor paper into this beautiful painting of an Amanita muscaria or fly agaric mushroom. Throughout this video, I'll discuss a little bit of my process for painting this mushroom, as well as uh, sharing some history that I recently discovered about the link between mushrooms, and in particular the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria mushroom, and how it connects to Christmas, and in particular the story of Santa Claus. If you're new here, welcome! My name is Lee. I'm a botanical and natural science illustrator based in Kitchener, Waterloo, Canada. On this channel, I share watercolor techniques and tips and some insights into my daily life as an illustrator. If this is content that you're interested in, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. So, where were we? Right, mushrooms. Those of you who have been following me for a while might already know that I really like mushrooms. But for those of you who are new here, I really like mushrooms. Like, really, really like mushrooms. Now, I don't mean I really like eating mushrooms, although I kind of wish I did because I feel like foraging for mushrooms would be really cool, but I don't really enjoy eating them. If you have some really good mushroom recipes, please go leave them in the comments down below. Um, I'd love to try them. And also, then you'll stick around uh, while I paint this mushroom because this is I'm gonna be a little while. So when I say I really like mushrooms, I really like painting them. So logically, when I was planning out what I was gonna do this month, I really wanted to paint some mushrooms. But I had already decided that I was going to prioritize painting a few small pieces that were focused on Christmassy or holiday or winter themes. And so initially I'd put any plans of painting any mushrooms or lichen or anything on the back burner because I recognize that, you know, not everyone wants to give or receive a card with a beautiful painting of a crusty twig for every holiday. That's just me. However, I kept on running across Christmas ornaments and Christmas cards and Christmas decor that had mushrooms on them. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. Many, although not all, of these mushroomy Christmas items featured fly agaric or Amanita muscaria mushrooms. And initially I thought, well, that's probably just because they've got red and white top to them, so they can mix really well into a red and white Christmas theme, and and hey, uh, this is late capitalism. We'll make anything into an ornament. You can also get ornaments that are shaped like a burger, or a llama, or a toilet paper roll. So, you know, why not a mushroom? Still, the frequency of mushroom ornaments was enough that I figured, hey, I guess mushrooms are Christmassy, and I'll make this painting. Speaking of which, I should probably explain what I'm doing at this point. Basically, what I'm doing here is I'm temperature mapping the areas of light and shadow using primary colors. These are applied in a relatively light wash, although stronger than you might think. And once I paint the body color and the and deepen the areas of shadow on top of this, this ties the whole image together and gives the colors a little bit more life. It makes the piece sort of glow, almost like an iridescent effect. Side note, iridescence. That's another thing that I'm going to be addressing in a future Vlogmas video. So, uh, lots to look forward to. I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, 
although this is my adaptation, um, this technique is heavily based on what I learned from John Pastoriza Pignol at a workshop at the American Society of Botanical Artists, specifically at their annual conference in 2019. I will leave links down below to John Pastoriza Pignol's website as well as the American Society of Botanical Artists. So basically the way this technique works is that using three, um, let's call them primary colors, so a yellow, a red or magenta, and a, a cyan or a blue, I'm mapping out which areas are in highlight, midtone, and shadow. Um, I'm wetting the whole area first where I'm applying. I'm leaving a spot of pure white for the brightest highlights. Right around that, I'm applying a layer of yellow around that edge through all of the areas that are mid-tone. So that's the color where you're going to actually see the real color of the object. I'm applying a magenta, or in this case, because I'm painting a bright red subject, I opted for an actually like a true red. And then around the very edges, I'm applying a cyan. I'm using a PB17 Peacock Blue from a discontinued Holbein line called Holbein Iridori. It's a really neat pigment. It's a little bit less light fast than other phthalos, but it is um, a really true cyan. And since I'm going to be covering this up anyway, I'm not too terribly concerned about the light fastness. Instead, you could use any kind of phthalo here. Now, I am putting down enough color that it's quite visible, it's quite bright, but once I build up the full tones, this is actually not going to show up very dark at all. There's quite a bit of planning and calculating with this technique, figuring out which areas in a complex shape are going to be in light or shadow, half tones, etc. It's pretty easy if you've got a fairly simple overall shape, um, like you're painting a single tulip, for example, and that's just sort of one rounded shape. This single mushroom isn't too bad, uh, although there is some fiddly bits in the stem that I'm having some trouble figuring out. I think this technique will work really well for this painting because I really want the top of this mushroom to have a really glossy, glowing look to it, uh, almost like a Christmas ornament. Like I want that almost glowing iridescent look of glass and carrying through those warm and cool colors through the underpainting really does help with that in my experience. I don't use this technique very frequently in my work, and I'd love to say that it's because most of my work is just small little complex uh, scraggly little bits of lichen where I don't really want it to have a glowing look. It's not really a glowing subject. Um, and that is true to an extent, but I think that the um, not so flattering interpretation is that this is just a really, really thinky task. Um, and the more complicated the shapes are in your composition, the more that you have interacting shadows, the more it's difficult to think about ahead of time which areas are going to be in midtone, which areas are going to be in shadow, um, and build that up in a sensible way. Um, so this is a technique that I don't use as much as I feel like maybe I could, and so it's nice to practice this here. Once I've finished the underpainting, then I'm going to start laying in the body color. So starting with the cap of the mushroom, I'm applying a bright red around the half tone area. So that's where, again, you see the true color of the mushroom cap. Around the shadowed area, you see a deeper, more bluish, purpley 
tone and I'm trying to push that as deep as I can over progressive layers, getting it nice and dark to where it is almost black. Like I really want to push the contrast in this painting. So you'll see me going back. I'm painting around the raised white dots on the top of the mushroom. Later on, I will go in with some white paint to just bump up the very top of those edges where they extend beyond and wouldn't be in quite as much shadow. Um, but mostly I'm trying to paint around because I find that trying to add white afterwards, it's a little bit tricky. It's better to try to work my shadows in um, around my highlights as much as I can practically. That said, I didn't want to use any kind of masking fluid or anything in this painting, so I definitely just focused on painting around. And so this is going to be a bit of a slow process. I'll let you watch me work away. Now, this is way sped up. Um, I did take six hours on this painting. Now, back to the lore around this mushroom. So I was struck with how frequently fly agaric or Amanita muscaria mushrooms showed up in Christmas motifs and I wondered whether it was just because of the coloring or whether there was something more to it and so I kind of just curiously looked it up last week and I found a really interesting series of articles. So Amanita muscaria has featured heavily in Christmas motifs since before Christmas was even a thing. So what's the link between Christmas and this specific mushroom? So apparently the first theorizing about this link, the first mentions show up in 1967 when an amateur scholar named R. Gordon Wasson. Wasson was into ethnobotany and he published a book that argued that shamans in the Far East used Amanita muscaria mushrooms for ceremonies around the winter solstice. Um, and that this has then developed into many of the fables surrounding Christmas. Uh, now, Wasson was specifically looking at the Korea people of Siberia and at Kamchatka, but since then, a lot of other scholars have piped in with additions to this story, and probably there's a lot of different groups and communities that have contributed different bits of this story. And so all of this comes into our collective lore about Christmas and what has become modern day Santa Claus. So uh, there's a few things that are important to know here. So first of all, um, it, let's talk a little bit about the distribution of Amanita muscaria mushrooms. So this is primarily a circumpolar species. Um, they have a very wide distribution though. So you will find Amanita muscaria mushrooms in Northern North America, Northern Europe, uh, Northern Asia, all the way around the globe. Um, as well as they do actually make their way down into more temperate regions to a certain extent as well. Um, now the main uh, range of Amanita muscaria mushrooms heavily overlaps with uh, where the native range of reindeer in northern Europe and northern Asia. And in these areas of overlap, um, Amanita muscaria was consumed by both people, particularly shamans, and also by reindeer. And this is where it's worth noting that Amanita muscaria mushrooms are psychedelic. They have hallucinogenic effects on both humans and reindeer. So according to Wasson, the Koryak people, the way their winter solstice celebrations worked is that the shamans of a community would uh, consume Amanita muscaria mushrooms, and they are psychedelic. They're also, however, very toxic in their raw form, so 
um, they need to be processed, uh, which means one of two things. The first one, which might have a link to Christmas imagery, is you can process them through a process that involves drying. And one of the ways that they might have been dried is to be put into socks and hung over a fireplace, um, which brings to mind the idea of stockings or boots placed by a fire. And the other one is actually reindeer can consume the raw mushrooms. Um, and then this is where it gets kind of gross. Shamans would collect reindeer urine and consume that, which still has the psychedelic effects of the mushroom, but doesn't have the toxicity. So apparently one of the beliefs that the Koryak people had, one of their rituals, was that the shamans would consume Amanita muscaria mushrooms, they would go on a hallucinogenic trip, and their legend says that during the trips the shamans could see the future of the community and they could turn into animals and fly towards the North Star in search of knowledge to share with the rest of the people. And then at the end of their trip, they would come back, return to the group in their yurt um, and meet with the community uh, and bring back gifts of knowledge and also gifts of medicine and food and healing, including Amanita muscaria mushrooms. So keeping in mind that this is all in the realm of fable and lore, and so some of these connections might be a little bit tenuous, but the idea is that this um, idea of the shamans traveling, flying towards the North Star is, uh, and then coming back and sharing gifts is similar to the idea of Santa Claus flying over to share gifts with all the people. With the Koryak people, there's a, a, another similarity, which is being in Siberia, often the front door of a yurt would be covered in snow. And so through the winter, there would be an opening in the roof. And so when the shaman comes in to meet with the community, he'd be coming in through the roof, similar to Santa coming down the chimney. Other scholars uh, studying other native groups have since chipped in with some extra information about other groups that may have also influenced this story. So for example, the indigenous people of Lapland, the Sami um, in Northern Finland uh, would visit people in their houses uh, for the winter solstice perform healing rituals using Amanita muscaria, and they considered Amanita muscaria holy to the point where the shamans actually dressed like the mushrooms. They wore red and white clothing. Unlike the Koryak people, the uh, shamans in, of the Sami also traveled by reindeer-drawn sleighs. Anyway, believers in this origin story of Santa Claus will suggest that, well, when you think about it, you have all of these different communities that are celebrating the winter solstice with Amanita muscaria mushrooms. They're having these hallucinogenic trips. They're, they've got reindeer, they've got shamans in red suits, they've got people coming down through the roof. Um, and it's not a far stretch when you are having a psychedelic trip to imagine, hey, uh, are those reindeer flying? Especially if the reindeer themselves are acting a little bit weird because they're also high. Anyway, I thought this, I, this whole story was really, really cool. Um, I think that there is a little bit of a glitch, which is we know that the Santa Claus red and white suit really only became a popular uh, motif in the 1930s when Coca-Cola commissioned an image of Santa Claus in red and white. And prior, St. Nicholas was pictured in all kinds of different colors. However, I'd love to believe that some of these stories have been influenced by these really neat ancient rituals. 
And in any case, I think we can all celebrate some fun uh, psychedelic mushroom inspired holidays. I think that's great. So uh, back to the painting progress. Um, you can see I'm hopping around this painting. I'm deepening colors. I'm adding the body color. And you can see as I paint that what originally looked like a really quite a bright, gaudy uh, set of primary colors where I mapped out my colors is now sort of vanishing into the background as I create this piece. And I can just keep picking away at this forever. I thought when I started this piece, oh, this is a nice, simple, small piece, you know, just a little five by seven, simple shapes. I'll be done in just an hour. And uh, uh, hmm, hmm. this is where I need that, uh, you know, that SpongeBob SquarePants little clip that shows up in YouTube videos all the time. I've got to figure out whether I can add it in here. For this video, I've sped this way up and cut out a bunch of sections. So you can watch this in a much quicker version while I play you some nice seasonal music. Well, uh, congrats, you've made it to the end of the video. So uh, you can go check out some other artists and come back on Monday for my next Vlogmas. But before you do, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, ring the bell so that you'll be notified when my next video comes up, which will be on Monday. So I am doing Vlogmas, but I'm only doing weekdays. I'm not doing weekends, so you'll see my next video on Monday. If you'd like to purchase this painting, the original is already listed in my shop. Uh, there's a link down below for that. And over the next few days, I will be listing cards made with this and other designs as well as some other fun fun things coming up soon thanks again for joining and i'll see you on monday